don't know, man, is the world just going bananas lately? I don't know. I feel like we're just accelerating the crazy. Like, like when you think about just how difficult things are, even in our own nation, like the most blessed nation on earth, even here, there's so much political turmoil. There's so much violence going on. I mean, even like in the past five and 10 years, like it just seems to keep amping up and amping up. We've got mass shootings. We've got hurricanes. And we've always had hurricanes, but man, it just seems like you, you just turn around twice and there's another one and then there's another one. We've got tsunamis. We've got world hunger. We've just got um, tragedy on the rise. And I don't know, sometimes are we just more aware of it because there's more media or is it actually increasing? Is it actually happening faster? Is it actually accelerating? And I don't know about you, but it's easy to look at this and, and do one of two things. Either just tune out, just be like, I can't, I can't deal with it. I can't handle what I'm seeing on the news. I'm just gonna pretend like I'm just gonna go out my life and try to, I don't know, just, just not notice or something. I'll feel bad for a minute, but then I gotta go back to what I'm doing. And so I don't know that I, I can even pay attention to it. Or, and maybe we're somewhere in the middle here, or we just start to stress out. We start to get a little bit afraid. Like what, what is about to happen? Are we, is, is this just getting worse and worse? Are we about to just completely implode like as a planet? Are we just gonna keep going off the rails? Is it just going to keep descending into greater and greater turmoil? Are we ever gonna be able to get along with people in a way that maybe we kind of hope or, or think maybe we once did? Are we ever gonna be able to solve some of these ginormous problems? And we can just begin to despair. We can begin to lose trust. And, and for those who are spiritual people, for those who are Christians, maybe you look up to the heavens and you say, God, what is going on? Like any time now, like that you wanna help solve some of this, I don't know where you are. I don't know why this is happening. I kind of thought things would be getting better as, as, as history progressed. And it seems like it takes jumps, but then it, it, it considerably gets worse. Um, I checked a website. I don't know if this is right, but they seem to know what they were talking about. There's, um, <laughs> that's how it is sometimes. There's currently 38 wars going on on the planet. Right now, 38 wars around the world. And guys, that just, that fills me with all kinds of like, Oh, Jesus, like when? When is this done? When is this gonna be over? How are you gonna come and save the day? You know, Jesus gave us this really encouraging prophecy and I wanna give you some hope today because the point of this message is to give you hope. It's a little bit scary, some of the stuff that we're talking about, but you already know it all. Like there's not a, not a bunch that, that's really new in terms of what we're going to encounter, but it's to give you hope to understand that Jesus Christ is a God of his word and he can be counted on no matter what's falling down around us, no matter what is shattering, no matter what's going wrong in our personal lives. Yeah, there's the stuff out there, but there's also, if we're honest, there's probably some turmoil going on on the inside of us. There's all kinds of hardship that we're experiencing. And so you got it on the outside, you got it on the inside. And what we need to know is that Jesus Christ will not fail us. He will strengthen us to endure everything that we've got to endure in order to get where he's trying to take us. So I wanna read you this really important prophecy. What's interesting about this is you've got, you've got to understand the disciples. If, if you pay attention to who these, these like 12 disciples are that follow Jesus around, not to mention everybody else, like the other outer disciples, you get the sense for sure that they don't really have a clue what they're doing. Like they don't know what's going on and Jesus will say things and, and they clearly like, they, they don't get it. And they're afraid to ask him questions sometimes or they completely misinterpret him. Now that's, compounded like that's more complicated by the fact that Jesus often just spoke cryptically and didn't necessarily explain what he meant all the time and so Jesus sometimes just says something really profound but it's wasted on them, them in the moment and they don't understand it until later after he's resurrected so let's listen to this really important prophecy John 14 2 Jesus says in my father's house are many rooms if it were not so would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you and if I go and prepare a place for you I will come again. Let's say that together. I will come again. That's what Jesus says. That's his promise. I will come again and take you to myself that where I am, you may also be. Now the disciples really, dude, they didn't even understand what he was talking about. Because you gotta remember at this point in history, they've got a very earthly understanding of Jesus's kingdom. 
Like they really think the temple's gonna stand forever. Jesus is gonna come in in the current form that he's in and he's gonna rule kind of like David. He's gonna throw off all the pagan influence on them like, uh, you know, like the Romans. He's gonna just get rid of them. Anybody else, any other enemies, Jesus is gonna set up this earthly kingdom where he's gonna rule. They get to be kind of the right-hand people. So the idea, he, they don't really know how's he gonna have these mansions and his father, I don't, where's he going? I don't really know. I don't understand what he's doing. But he's prophesying to these folks and he says, you've got to know for later, I will return and I'm gonna come get you. No matter how bleak it is, no matter how dark it is, you need to know this is true. So most, many of us are familiar with like the week before Jesus was crucified. We, we've, we've, you've talked about this probably. There's Palm Sunday, remember? That's like, he comes in on the donkey, people throwing down the palm branches and they're like, Jesus save now. And everyone's kind of excited, like, is this the king? Oh, this is gonna be so great. What you may not know is that as the week went on, things got worse and worse, even for Jesus. So like he comes in and, and you're thinking it's gonna be this awesome thing. Yeah, everyone's gonna celebrate for him and, and clap and he gets into the temple and he immediately begins to kick people out of it. He's just throwing folks out, hey, get out of here. And then he begins to really take the, the religious leaders of the time, he takes them to task. He starts to rebuke them publicly. He's even telling parables about how bad they are. He's talking about how they're, these, they're really the villains in all these stories. And he starts to denounce them. He's like, woe to you guys. And you know, everyone who's watching is like, whoa, Jesus, wow, settle down, man. I thought we were like gonna have a party and now like you're, you're rebuking everybody. And, and it's getting worse and worse. It's fomenting. And at one point, Jesus even says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem how I've longed to gather you to my breast, but you would not allow it. Now your house is left to you empty. And saying that about the holy city, about Jerusalem had to be confusing. Like, what are you talking about? Because see, remember, in, in, the, in the minds of these folks, Jerusalem's gonna be forever now. Like the temple's gonna be forever. The idea that in 70 AD, the Romans are gonna come in and completely demolish the temple, that is not on anybody's radar. No one has any clue that any of that's gonna happen. And so they're just confused as they're hearing Jesus um, completely denouncing Jesus, denounce the, the religious leaders and even the temple itself because actually the temple now in some ways opposes Jesus because he's the new real temple. That's, that's what's happening there. And Jesus begins to discern this and he says, okay, I need to leave my disciples a little bit of a plan. I need to leave them a little bit of preparation. I need them to understand that what they think is about to happen is not actually about to happen. Because remember, this is pre-crucifixion. This is pre-bring the gospel to the ends of the earth. Like they don't know any of that's gonna happen. They don't know that Jesus is gonna rise from the dead. And he's even like said it, but whew, they don't get it. And so now Jesus says, I'll tell you what I gotta do. You've got some presuppositions that might not be helpful. So I'm gonna explain to you how it's actually gonna go. And he begins to outline, hey, here's what's going to happen next with regard to the history of the kingdom of God. I know you guys can't imagine it, but I'm going to explain it to you. So let's look at this, uh, this, uh, this image up here on the, on the screen. We'll put this out on social media for anybody that um, needs to see this this week. Here's where we're gonna be today. So this is the, the story, the outline of the return of Christ. Over on the left, that's the first coming of Christ. That's when he is crucified. And then is what's called the church age. That's up to the first dash. We're gonna talk about that today. And then next week, we're gonna talk about this thing called the tribulation. So if you like the really spooky stuff, make sure that you bring a friend, a spooky friend next week, um, and we'll walk through that. But let's just talk about the first era, the first epoch right now, because Jesus wants not only his disciples to be prepared, but if you're a disciple of Jesus Christ, he wants you to be prepared. This is something we've got to understand about Bible prophecy. See, we can get really excited about it. It's like, oh, cool, that's, that's the future. What's gonna happen there? Can I just caution all of us? We need to talk with a lot of humility about Bible prophecy. Here's why. Because in the past 2,000 years, you could project just about any event onto the pages of scripture. Okay, there's always been some political nut job that they're like, that's the guy. Right? There's always been you know, disruptions in the earth. There's always been wars going on. You're like, oh man, now it's, it's getting real. Hey, um, let's just keep humility and say, what is, what is God trying to tell us through here? Because here's what he's always trying to do with prophecy. Yes, he's trying to give us a basic understanding, but prophecy is always about influencing the behavior of people in the present. That's what it's really about. So it's not just, oh, you get clues, you kind of get the script. It's about, Lord, what do you want me to do in light of this information. So because he's a compassionate God, because he's a loving God, let's listen to what he says. Matthew 24, one, Jesus came out of the temple and was going away when his disciples came up to 
point out the temple buildings to him. Now they love this temple, man. I mean, this is, this is a wonder. They're, they're, they're drinking it in. And he said to them, do you see all these things? Truly, I tell you, not one stone here will be left upon another, which will not be torn down. He's talking about the destruction of the temple that would happen in 70 AD. As he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. They're kind of wigged out. Tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign of your coming at the end of the age? And Jesus, he knows, my friends, there's gonna be cataclysmic events that are not only gonna happen to the nation of Israel, they're not only gonna happen to your temple that are gonna happen in Jerusalem, there are civilizations that are gonna rise and fall that you cannot imagine. And all of that is a part of the story as we come to what is really gonna be the return of Christ. But you don't understand, my friends, is that the kingdom of God, the disciples didn't get this quite yet, it starts as a seed. It's not gonna visibly appear right away. You're waiting for me to just, just pull up my throne and start ruling. And it starts, the kingdom of God means the rulership of God first inside people's hearts. And then there's a physical expression later. And the subjects of the kingdom were the ones who made Jesus their king when they couldn't see his throne ruling and reigning on earth. And Jesus says, there needs to be time for that to happen. That seed needs to go into the ground, into people's hearts, it needs to germinate so that we can see God produce sons and daughters of God. Verse four, and Jesus answered and said to them, see to it that no one misleads you. There'll be a lot of misleading. See to it that no one misleads you. Verse five, for many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will mislead many. You will be hearing of wars, rumors of wars. See to it that you're not frightened for those things must take place, but that is not yet the end. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. In various places, there'll be famines and earthquakes, but all these things are merely the beginnings of birth pangs. See, the father doesn't want us to be afraid. He doesn't want us to be surprised. He doesn't want us to be alarmed. He says, you're gonna see a lot of stuff that is gonna shock you. And one of the things you need to know is, first, don't be frightened. Don't be misled and understand such things. You hear the word he said? He said, they must happen. See, God is a sovereign God that has a plan that you and I cannot comprehend. Like if he explained it to us, we wouldn't get it. And he says, these things are gonna happen. You gotta trust me. There's certain things that are gonna happen in the world and you just have to believe I'm still in control. I'm still in charge. Verse nine, and then they will deliver you to tribulation and kill you. And you will be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will fall away and will betray one another and hate one another. Many false prophets will arise and mislead many because lawlessness is increased. Most people's love will grow cold. But the one who endures, somebody say endure. The one who endures to the end, he will be saved. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as testimony to all the nations. And then the end will come. Man, that sounds pretty grim. <laughs> Yikes. I don't know if I want any of that. Hey, let's explore this. Let's, let's understand this by looking at a key idea that Jesus says in verse eight. But all these things are merely the beginning of birth pangs. So my wife has had five babies. So five different times she's gone into labor. Okay, and here's what we know when the birth pangs start. All right, the process has started. Now this isn't the end. This is actually the beginning. This is how we get to the deliverance. This is how we get to the delivery. But they, they come in these waves of pain. Mamas, you know about this, right? There's these waves of pain. And as time goes by, those waves of pain increase in intensity and they get closer together. And these birth pangs tell us, hey man, it's about to happen. We're getting closer and closer and closer to where the vision is going to come to pass. That's what Jesus says about this time that we're in right now. This is this church age, he says, you're gonna notice all kinds of wars, rumors of wars, people hating you, people betraying you, and all that is, is birth pangs. That means, hello, it's getting closer. Those contractions are getting closer and closer together. Something's about to happen. There's a deliverance about to come forth. Now, there's a lot of pain involved in birth pangs. If we walked into the hospital and we went into the delivery ward, we'd hear maybe some, some mamas crying out, some mamas screaming, and yet we'd be filled with hope. We're like, oh, I know that hurts, but hallelujah, there's about to be some life that results out of, out of this. But how many know that feels a little different than when you go into the cancer ward and you hear people crying out? Because you know, in most cases, those cries don't turn into life. 
My friends, that's how Jesus wants us to hear about these birth pangs. He says, I know they're really hard. I know they're really difficult. I know that they sometimes will make you question the God of heaven. And yet you need to understand that these birth pains result in life. They result in deliverance for this, this planet that really set itself up as the rebel planet against their maker. And yet the maker takes it upon himself. I'm going to deliver these people. And the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to first die on the cross for their sins. They've all betrayed me just like I've betrayed him, just like you've betrayed him. Jesus Christ is going to take the penalty for that betrayal and he's gonna get on the cross and die and that's going to justify everybody who trusts in Jesus and makes him their king. But that's not all. He's gonna turn corruption backwards. He's gonna start to deliver this planet, but first there's gotta be birth pangs. We've gotta go through this delivery process. The Bible talks about this all the time, Romans 8, 22, for we know that all creation, it's not just humans, it's the planet, it's the universe for all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. So what do we do about these birth pangs? How, how do we get through this? Like, how do we make sense of this? We endure, that's what we do. Number one, we endure. Number two, we share the good news. Let's pull these apart. But the one who endures to the end, he will be saved. To endure means to suffer something painful, or difficult patiently. It means to uh, last. It means to remain in existence. When we endure, we operate by steadfast commitment. It means we don't give up. It means we keep going. It means even if I'm going through hell, I just keep going until I get out of hell. We just keep pushing. We don't stop here and we keep on pushing right up to the point that one of two things is gonna happen, my friends. Jesus is gonna come to get us or we're gonna go to see him anyway. One of those things is gonna happen and Jesus says, you've gotta know it's gonna get so cray cray. You need to decide right now you're going to endure. You don't always need to understand everything. You don't always need to um, feel great about everything, but you do need, if you're gonna follow Jesus, to endure. And you guys know what it's like. You know what it's like to have to endure. You've had to, to endure sickness. You've had to endure sick kids. You've had to endure broken hearts. You've had to push through things that you thought would kill you and yet you made it. So I just wanna encourage you right now, maybe it's not about the cosmos, maybe it's not about what's going on in the world, but maybe there's some circumstances and situations that you're in right now and you have no idea what to do and it doesn't seem like any wisdom is coming at you anytime soon. Can I just give you, here's what the master says, when you're going through hell and back, just endure. Like just hang on because it may result in your deliverance if you don't give up. See, here's what I found. You can get through just about anything as long as you have hope. As long as you hope that things can change, as long as you hope things can get better, you can really survive amazing things. So hear that for your own life right now. If you will hope that things can get better, you will make it. Slap your neighbor awake, tell him you can make it. You can make it, man. Hey, you can make it. Come on, we're not gonna wuss out here. You can make it. So let's talk about four birth pangs that won't last forever. Hallelujah, they won't last forever. You can make it. Like we're going to be delivered through this despite the intensity of the birth pangs. Number one, disciples must endure hate and betrayal. What did it say, verse 10? At that time, many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. Man, you know, persecution is hard and Christians get persecuted. In fact, we're living in a moment right now where some say Christians have never been more persecuted on the earth than they are right now. And that's a reality. And after so much persecution, man, it can just be hard to keep going. But he also said, you'll be hated. And that hate means you're gonna have antagonists. You're gonna have people that are pushing against you. You're gonna have people that won't let up on you. You're gonna have people that all they wanna do is seemingly to bring you down. And the reason they're gonna try to do that is because of Jesus Christ. Like because you bear his name, they're really aiming at him and hitting you. If they hated him, they're gonna hate you. Isn't that encouraging today? Welcome to Torch of Faith. <laughs> so glad you're here. Um, yeah, but, but man, look, I, I, here's what I know, man. I need good messages. I need encouraging messages of like, hey, you can do anything. God always loves you and blesses you. But I also need like the real stuff that reminds me, dude, when somebody hates you, that was exactly what Jesus said would happen. So like, let's just all clue in that we have to endure hate and betrayal. Here's what I've found. Um, 
in this section, Jesus is actually talking about the church, just so we know. So he's not even just talking about people outside. He's talking about inside. I don't, I don't know that there's much worse kind of pain than the pain of feeling like you've been betrayed by someone in your spiritual family. You know what I'm talking about? Like when you're betrayed by somebody that just doesn't, doesn't even like God, you know what I'm saying? Like, forget it. Um, they're like, yeah, that makes sense. When, when I'm betrayed by a Christian, it's like, oh, yes, come on. We're on the same team. How do you not, like, why would you do that? And, and it just, I don't know if it's the worst pain, but I think it's, it's, it's pretty close. The feeling that I was betrayed by someone who's part of my own family. And I know that the enemy doesn't care if they really meant to hurt me or if I just perceive that they meant to hurt me. He doesn't care. He's still going to use it to bring discouragement. You see, Christian fellowship is supposed to be a taste of heaven. Yet, let's all clue in here. It is still broken. It is still damaged. It is still experiencing birth pangs just like everything else on the planet. So we've got to decide ahead of time. First, I don't want to betray anybody, but I'm going to recognize that sometimes I'm going to get betrayed. And that doesn't mean that the church is all evil. It doesn't mean that everyone's a jerk. It just means, ugh, I can endure this because that's what Jesus commanded me to do. And I'm not gonna paint with a broad brush. I'm gonna say, that hurt. Maybe we can redeem this. Maybe we can solve this. Maybe I can be a little more tender hearted. Maybe I can uh, try to keep um, uh, short accounts with everybody so that I don't par participate in anyone else feeling betrayed. But at the end of the day, my friends, we've got to endure that pain. And maybe that's the result for you of someone you were really intentional with, like someone you raised. Maybe it was somebody that you, you have uh, bled for and prayed for, and now they're like turning against you. You're like, God, what is happening? He says, I'm not gonna explain everything to you, but I need you to endure because that's what Christians do. They endure that kind of thing. Here's the good news. Um, the time of betrayal will not last. It won't last, baby. There's a day coming when there will be no more betrayal. You will never have that problem again. No one will ever make you feel bad or small or weird or anything like that. But for now, we need to endure. Here's number two, disciples must endure apostasy. Yikes. Now you're gonna, you're gonna encounter this before long if you don't know. <clears throat> there are folks that are converted, like they have a shallow conversion to Jesus, but as time goes by, it doesn't seem like they really have oriented their life around him. And that can be confusing when you see that because someone's like, they're excited for a minute. They're like, I love Jesus. But in their hearts, they really didn't turn toward him. And so when the fire comes, when the pressure comes of the church age that Jesus is talking about, when there's wars and rumors of wars, when everything's breaking loose, when people are hating them, it can be easy for those who didn't really invite Jesus into every part of their heart, they turn around. And if you've seen somebody You've been close to somebody who on one day said, I love Jesus, but on the next day began to embrace darkness and they weren't becoming more and more like Christ. They're becoming more and more distant from Christ. And I don't mean for just a season. We all stumble, we all backslide, we all make mistakes. But I mean, in the trajectory of their life, it didn't prove true of them that they were a new creature. They seemed like just the old creature that was going to church for a little while, and then maybe they gave up. They've traded their allegiance from Jesus to something else. That's called apostasy. That's called an apostate. And Jesus says, just check it out. You're gonna see that. I don't want you to be surprised by that. What did he say? At that time, many will fall away. Many is a lot. Like that's a high percentage. A lot will fall away because fire will reveal that they didn't really covet Jesus himself. And it's not for us to like label people that. What it is for us to do is say, I'm not surprised when I see that because the Lord told me it would happen and I'm going to endure anyway. Similar to the way some, most of you know about the Lord of the Rings and the one ring, right? It looks like a normal ring at first, but you put it in fire and it reveals its true nature. My friends, the fire of difficulty and persecution and hardship tends to reveal our, full, our, our true nature. Like it shows, here, here's, here's what's really going on in that heart. What they act like when, when they're under pressure is what they're really like. So I say this to encourage you, if you've got folks that, 
Man, you, you, th- you thought you knew, like, oh, it's a sure thing, man. They were following Christ, but now they've fallen away. Doesn't, if they're still, man, if they're still alive, you keep praying. You keep believing for them. Because at the end of the day, we don't know anybody's heart, but we don't want to be overly disappointed when we see that kind of thing. You know, one of the things I'm fully convinced of is that once someone is saved, they are saved, okay? I believe the Bible teaches that. I'll give you an example. In John 10, 28, that means when, when they've made Jesus their king and trusted him for forgiveness, like the Lord himself grabs them. He's the one who caused them to, to receive that of God you are in Christ, 1 Corinthians uh, 1, 31. But he's also the one who carries them through. He's the one who helps them make it all the way there. Jesus says in, in uh, John 10, 28, I give, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. Nobody, not even them. But the proof that that happened is that they continue on through life. That's the perseverance of the saints. That means, hey, you can tell the fruit because they might stumble. They might stumble seven times, but the Lord will lift them up and help them along the way. What should that do to us? Like how are we supposed to think about that? We should recognize, my friend, that people fall and we shouldn't be flippant about that. We shouldn't be um, not sober about that because at, here's what the enemy's gonna try to do. He's gonna try to bring, it could be a sin that he just, you're just enamored with and you're tempted to leave devotion to Christ just for this thing. It could be just your own will, your own way. It could be some offense that somebody hurts you with and it kind of spins you out and you're like, ah, forget about the whole God thing. And you might find after a while that your heart is so hard, it's hard to come back. That happens to people all the time. So just, let's just be cautious, shouldn't we? Like, hey man, trust that Jesus saves me, but don't go flirting with sin. Like don't go flirting with, with the kinds of things that tend to take people out of the race. When I was a little boy, my folks take me, took me and my family, so there's seven of us, at the Museum of Science and Industry. And, you know, we're walking through, and I'm looking at all the stuff, and I just get, I'm not paying attention. Get separated from my parents. You know, I'm a little boy, man, and so I start to cry, and I go find, like, the security guard, police officer guy, and I don't know what to do. And so they take me in their little, like, hub office thing, and, and sure enough, my parents come around the corner, and, oh, there they are, and I'm reunited. But I'll tell you what, after that experience, there's a little caution in me. Hey, kid, don't go wandering off because you don't want to get lost. And can I just lovingly say to all of us who are living in the church age when we need to endure a lot of stuff, can I just lovingly and respectfully say, hey, kid, don't go wandering off. Like have a little bit of humility and sobriety. Hey, um, the enemy has taken out greater Christians than you. So let's just all be sober-minded about it and recognize, um, hey, but by the, great, by the grace of God, I would go there as well. Now, here's the good, good news. There will come a day when shallow, hypocritical versions of pursuing Christ will not exist. This is only a birth pang. There is a season, there is a time, there is a kingdom where no one ever is phony. No one's ever faking anything. No one's ever trying to manufacture devotion. Like, dude, it is pure and real, and it is coming if you can make it through. Can you endure it? I know you can. Here's number three. Disciples must endure false prophets. All right, if you thought it was awkward before, here we go. In verse five, he said, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ like I'm the guy and mislead many. I don't think that necessarily just means that they're gonna say, hey, I'm Jesus, by the way. Certainly there's people like David Crush. There's like actual cult leaders that are claiming to be Jesus. And they're they're maybe sometimes a little bit easier to see. But there's other voices that will come along and they'll say, I am the answer. Like I should be central. I'm the thing that you need in your life to solve all your problems. I'll give you peace. I'll give you hope. And we just need to watch out for what these are. Certainly there's false doctrines. Okay, and I'm just gonna name names. Okay, there's Jehovah's Witnesses. There are Mormons. And here's the problem. They're really not leading toward Jesus. They're leading toward a system where you have to perform really well. That's not the same thing as trusting in the Jesus that just saves you because he's awesome. So those, those, like, those doctrinal things matter. It doesn't mean we're mad at anybody. It just means, dude, truth matters. And like, we, need to, we need to distinguish that. But there's also just places we put our hope that I just want to challenge us to think about, okay? 
Now, I'm politically minded. Like I care about politic type stuff. I believe change should happen and can happen. And politics is a way that that happens. But can I just challenge all of us? Dude, if you are putting your hope in some political leader to come along or some political system to get in power, can I tell you lovingly, you will not stop the birth pangs. There's nothing the Democrats or the Republicans can do about it. The birth pangs are here. They are here for the duration, okay? Until the tribulation and then Jesus comes back, it's here. And so, yeah, man, try to, try to be an activist. Try to make things happen. But just understand, that is not a Messiah. That is not the answer. And if it's drawing your focus from the answer, you need to just like check yourself. Um, check this out too. I believe that when Jesus looks at the way we've treated our planet, the way we've polluted our rivers and streams and oceans, I believe he's sad about that. Like, I don't think he wants us to do that. I think that we need to continue to find more and more ways to better steward his earth, not because humans are a parasite, but because they're stewards, because they were put here to do that. But if our hope is in environmental, just like deliverance, can I tell you that is a false Messiah. That is not Jesus. And it doesn't matter how clean you make the planet, the planet cannot save anybody. Like the blood of Jesus alone is what's, and I know I'm probably stepping on your toes, I don't care. <laughs> um, hey, here's, here's one more. Um, Sometimes you'll see um, different bumper stickers that, that seem to imply that the real problem is that all the religions just need to get together and agree. Like if we just all coexist, if we just all, hey man, quit, quit um, maximizing things that should be minimal and, and, and quit pointing that out. And can I just say, hey man, that's a nice idea. And they tried to do that in Israel's history. It's called syncretism. It didn't work. Everyone's afraid to offend anybody else's God. So they just kind of put them all together. The problem is the true God doesn't like that because he's nothing like a lot of these gods. Okay, he's nothing like Allah. The Quran says that Allah begat none. He has no sons. God the Father says he begat his one and only son, Jesus Christ. Those can't both be true, man. Okay, it doesn't mean we don't love Muslims. It just means that can't be true, that they're both the same. And so if we're gonna exalt the one saving God, we've got to say, hey man, doctrine matters, which is why I wanna challenge everybody. While we're on this enduring moment, you should be studying the Bible, studying good theology, studying good doctrine. And my friends, you gotta hear the heart. It, it's not to judge anybody or, or discourage anybody. We wanna love everybody exactly where they are. Acceptance is where the conversation begins. And at the same time, we've gotta recognize if you're gonna grow up into maturity, you've gotta have eyes to see and recognize truth from falsehood so that you can help people onto the ark of King Jesus. I could use a little more shouts while we still have time. What are we saying at the end of the day? Um, all these things are, some of these things can be really good, but utopia is not coming. I know we're, we're, we've been told that for like decades. Hey man, if we just keep progressing in tech and keep, keep you know, passing new laws and keep doing new social justice things, finally one day utopia will get here. It won't, at least according to Jesus. That thing you long for, that utopia, it's called the kingdom of heaven. It's where you were actually made to live. And Jesus is the only one who can bring us there. And part of the message that, that Jesus is trying to tell everybody through, through this end time scenario is, humans, I love you. You can do so much right and so much good. You cannot deliver yourselves. You can't deliver yourselves from the birth pangs. When you see the world crumbling around you, you gotta know I have one deliverer and he will stand upon the earth and someday in my flesh I shall see God, but he and he alone will get glory for delivering planet earth. Amen. Are we hearing that? Finally, disciples must endure lawlessness. Verse 12, because lawlessness is greased, most people's love will grow cold. I believe we're seeing a little bit of this right now in our own country. I believe lawlessness, a lack of respect for law, produces lovelessness. I believe this is what Jesus is saying. He says it right there. Because lawlessness is increased, most people's love will grow cold. But you know what happens when people start loving less? You have to pass more laws. And as you pass more laws, they start loving less. So you hear what we're saying? You just keep spiraling downward. You can't pass laws that cause people to love. So what do we need to do, church? We need to be the people that do two things. We need to respect the law, but we need to increase the love. And this is where I think we need to recognize that social media is a hard place to love people. It's hard to feel love on social media. So if that's our only strategy for impacting people, we might wanna rethink that. We need to honor the law, obey the law, but then we need to be the most radical folks of saying there's a leak in love, so I gotta amp it up 
and I gotta get it on as many people as I possibly can. The good news is the time of lawlessness someday will be over if we can endure it. So what do we know? If we're gonna be a disciple, we have to endure hate, betrayal, apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness. Now here's the good news. The birth pangs closer together, increasing in intensity as we watch it over our years. The great news is that means the deliverance is that much closer. The time to deliver this baby, this new kingdom, this new world Jesus order is closer and closer if we'll pay attention. I saw this um, picture online this week. It's actually from about a year and a half ago. This is on the West Coast. And I have so much compassion for folks that are going through difficulty with fires there. But I just, I think this tells a story a little bit, okay, about the state of at least our nation right now. There's a mountain of fire by three guys playing golf, okay? And it's like somehow, you know, in, in my understanding of this picture, they're like, I'm aware that there's f- uh, like fire coming down the mountain in my direction, but I'm just gonna like not think about that. I don't feel like I can do anything about that, so I'm just gonna give myself to the hobby that I'm doing or the fun or the business that I'm doing or my little life. Like I'm not gonna think about the approaching fire not going to think about it. My friends, you and I have to be the ones to think about it because the world around you is beginning to burn. It is in the moment of severe contractions, like it is happening. And we can't be the ones that are just always on vacation, trying to build our little earthly empires that are destined for that fire to run right over it. Are we hearing that? The time is short, but what that also means is the time is almost over when we have the opportunity to share the love of Jesus Christ with people. That time is also running out. And so we need to make the best use of it. Disciples, here's your final little line, little point there. Disciples share the gospel and they wait for Jesus. They share the gospel and they wait for Jesus. The gospel is available to all. That means I trust Jesus Christ to forgive my sins and there's nobody on earth that Jesus doesn't want to give that to. You see that in 1 Timothy 2, 3, and 4. This is good and pleasing in the sight of God our Savior who desires all people to be saved. Somebody say all. All. There's nobody that is outside of the bounds of God's love. God wants everybody to come in. But listen to how he describes salvation because it does include forgiveness. It includes forgiveness, but that's not all it is. Listen to 2 Corinthians 5, 15. And he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. What it really means to come to Christ is say, Jesus, I choose you over me. I'm determined with your help to leave myself as the God and you get to be the God. And I get forgiveness along with it, but I actually get a better driver. I get somebody who's a better ruler of little old me than I am. So what do we do? We share gospel, we share the gospel in faith that it's necessary for the return of Christ. So my friends, you've got a job to do while we're still yet here in this epoch, in this season, in this time before Jesus returns like he promised he would, you've got a job to do. And yes, you're supposed to grow and enjoy your family and grow in maturity and learn to endure and grow in fruitfulness. But my friends, it is on you and on me to lay down our lives for the gospel of Jesus Christ every day. That's what we're supposed to do. That's the master's instructions while we're still here on earth. So what we'll do is we'll severely inconvenience ourselves to help people find their way back to God. And we've got to have that attitude because the time is short. But we can get through anything if we'll just put our hope in the master who said he would return and is going to disciples endure and they share their faith as they wait on Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord, a lot in there. Um, I pray for us. I pray that you'd strengthen us now. I pray that you convict us now. Lord, I pray that we would be appropriately humble about things that have to do with like the end times. I pray that we would see your signature, see your hand in the world around us. And I pray we'd not be frightened 
We'd not be like people that have no hope, but rather we would boldly and resolutely keep our eyes on the prize and keep enduring and keep pushing forward and not giving up, knowing it is not all dependent on us, but it is you who's going to deliver us. And God, open our mouths to share your good news, the good news of the forgiveness and kingship of Jesus Christ with everyone we can. In Christ's name.